Chapter twenty seven of the Voyage Out by Virginia Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. All that evening the clouds gathered until they closed entirely over the blue of the sky. They seemed to narrow the space between earth and heaven so that there was no room for the air to move in freely. And the waves, too, lay flat and yet rigid as if they were restrained. The leaves on the bushes and trees in the garden hung closely together, and the feeling of pressure and restraint was increased by the short chirping sounds which came from birds and insects. So strange were the lights and the silence that the busy hum of voices which usually filled the dining room at meal times had distinct gaps in it and during these silences the clatter of the knives upon plates became audible. The first roll of thunder and the first heavy drop striking the pane caused a little stir. "'It's coming,' was said simultaneously in many different languages. There was a profound silence as if the thunder had withdrawn into itself. People had just begun to eat again, when a gust of cold air came through the open windows, lifting tablecloths and skirts. A light flashed, and was instantly followed by a clap of thunder right over the hotel. The rain swished with it, and immediately there were all those sounds of windows being shut and doors slamming violently, which accompany a storm. The room grew suddenly several degrees darker, for the wind seemed to be driving waves of darkness across the earth. No one attempted to eat for a time, but sat looking out at the garden, with their forks in the air. The flashes now came frequently, lighting up faces as if they were going to be photographed, surprising them in tense and unnatural expressions. The clap followed close and violently upon them, Several women half rose from their chairs and then sat down again, but dinner was continued uneasily with eyes upon the garden. The bushes outside were ruffled and whitened, and the wind pressed upon them so that they seemed to stoop to the ground. The waiters had to press dishes upon the diner's notice, and the diners had to draw the attention of waiters for they were all absorbed in looking at the storm. As the thunder showed no signs of withdrawing, but seemed massed right overhead, while the lightning aimed straight at the garden every time, an uneasy gloom replaced the first excitement. Finishing the meal very quickly, people congregated in the hall where they felt more secure than in any other place because they could retreat far from the windows. And although they heard the thunder, they could not see anything. A little boy was carried away sobbing in the arms of his mother. While the storm continued, no one seemed inclined to sit down, but they collected in little groups under the central skylight where they stood in a yellow atmosphere, looking upwards. Now and again their faces became white, as the lightning flashed, and finally a terrific crash came, making the panes of the skylight lift at the joints. Ah! several voices exclaimed at the same moment. Something struck, said a man's voice. The rain rushed down. The rain seemed now to extinguish the lightning and the thunder, and the hall became almost dark. After a minute or two, when nothing was heard but the rattle of water upon the glass, there was a perceptible slackening of the sound, and then the atmosphere became lighter. "'It's over,' said another voice. At a touch all the electric lights were turned on and revealed a crowd of people all standing, all looking with rather strained faces up at the skylight. But when they saw each other in the artificial light, 
they turned at once and began to move away. For some minutes the rain continued to rattle upon the skylight, and the thunder gave another shake or two, but it was evident from the clearing of the darkness and the light drumming of the rain upon the roof that the great confused ocean of air was travelling away from them, and passing high overhead with its clouds and its rods of fire out to sea. The building, which had seemed so small in the tumult of the storm, now became as square and spacious as usual. As the storm drew away, the people in the hall of the hotel sat down, and with a comfortable sense of relief began to tell each other stories about great storms, and produced in many cases their occupations for the evening. The chessboard was brought out, and Mr. Elliot, who wore a stock instead of a collar as a sign of convalescence, but was otherwise much as usual, challenged Mr. Pepper to a final contest. Round them gathered a group of ladies with pieces of needlework, or in default of needlework, with novels, to superintend the game, much as if they were in charge of two small boys playing marbles. Every now and then they looked at the board and made some encouraging remark to the gentlemen. Mrs. Paley, just round the corner, had her cards arranged in long ladders before her, and Susan sitting near to sympathize but not to correct, and the merchants and the miscellaneous people who had never been discovered to possess names were stretched in their armchairs with their newspapers on their knees. The conversation in these circumstances was very gentle fragmentary and intermittent, but the room was full of the indescribable stir of life. Every now and then the moth, which was now grey of wing and shiny of thorax, whizzed over their heads and hit the lamps with a thud. A young woman put down her needlework and exclaimed, Poor creature! It would be kinder to kill it but nobody seemed disposed to rouse himself in order to kill the moth. They watched it dash from lamp to lamp because they were comfortable and had nothing to do. On the sofa beside the chess players Mrs. Elliot was imparting a new stitch in knitting to Mrs. Thornbury, so that their heads came very near together and were only to be distinguished by the old lace cap which Mrs. Thornbury wore in the evening. Mrs. Elliot was an expert at knitting, and disclaimed a compliment to that effect with evident pride. I suppose we're all proud of something, she said, and I'm proud of my knitting. I think things like that run in families. We all knit well. I had an uncle who knitted his own socks to the day of his death, and he did it better than any of his daughters, dear old gentleman. Now I wonder that you, Miss Allen, who use your eyes so much, don't take up knitting in the evenings. You'd find it such a relief, I should say, such a rest to the eyes. And the bazaars are so glad of things. Her voice dropped into the smooth, half-conscious tone of the expert knitter. The words came gently, one after another. As much as I do I can always dispose of, which is a comfort, for then I feel that I am not wasting my time. Miss Allen, being thus addressed, shut her novel and observed the others placidly for a time. At last she said, it is surely not natural to leave your wife because she happens to be in love with you. But that, as far as I can make out, is what the gentleman in my story does. Tut, tut, that doesn't sound good. No, that doesn't sound at all natural, murmured the knitters in their absorbed voices. Still, it's the kind of book people call very clever. Miss Allen added. 
Maternity by Michael Jessop, I presume, Mr. Elliot put in, for he could never resist the temptation of talking while he played chess. Do you know, said Mrs. Elliot after a moment, I don't think people do write good novels now. Not as good as they used to, anyhow. No one took the trouble to agree with her or to disagree with her. Arthur Venning, who was strolling about, sometimes looking at the game, sometimes reading a page of a magazine, looked at Miss Allen, who was half asleep, and said humorously, A penny for your thoughts, Miss Allen. The others looked up. They were glad that he had not spoken to them. But Miss Allen replied without any hesitation, I was thinking of my imaginary uncle. Hasn't everyone got an imaginary uncle? she continued. I have one, a most delightful old gentleman. He's always giving me things. Sometimes it's a gold watch. Sometimes it's a carriage and pair. Sometimes it's a beautiful little cottage in the new forest. Sometimes it's a ticket to the place I most want to see. She set them all thinking vaguely of the things they wanted. Mrs. Elliot knew exactly what she wanted. She wanted a child. And the usual little pucker deepened on her brow. We're such lucky people, she said, looking at her husband. We really have no wants. She was apt to say this, partly in order to convince herself, and partly in order to convince other people, but she was prevented from wondering how far she carried conviction by the entrance of Mr. and Mrs. Flushing, who came through the hall and stopped by the chessboard. Mrs. Flushing looked wilder than ever. A great strand of black hair looped down across her brow, her cheeks were whipped a dark blood red, and drops of rain made wet marks upon them. Mr. Flushing explained that they had been on the roof watching the storm. It was a wonderful sight, he said. The lightning went right out over the sea, and lit up the waves and the ships far away. You can't think how wonderful the mountains looked, too with the lights on them, and the great masses of shadow. It's all over now. He slid down into a chair, becoming interested in the final struggle of the game. And you go back tomorrow? said Mrs. Thornbury, looking at Mrs. Flushing. Yes, she replied. And indeed one is not sorry to go back said Mrs. Elliot, assuming an air of mournful anxiety. After all this illness. Are you afraid of dying? Mrs. Flushing demanded scornfully. I think we are all afraid of that, said Mrs. Elliot with dignity. I suppose we're all cowards when it comes to the point, said Mrs. Flushing, rubbing her cheek against the back of the chair. I'm sure I am. Not a bit of it, said Mr. Flushing, turning round, for Mr. Pepper took a very long time to consider his move. It's not cowardly to wish to live, Alice. It's the very reverse of cowardly. Personally, I'd like to go on for a hundred years. Granted, of course, that I had the full use of my faculties. Think of all the things that are bound to happen. That is what I feel, Mrs. Thornbury rejoined. The changes, the improvements, the inventions, and beauty. Do you know, I feel sometimes that I couldn't bear to die and cease to see beautiful things about me. It would certainly be very dull to die before they have discovered whether there is life in Mars, Miss Allen added. Do you really believe there's life in Mars? asked Mrs. Flushing, turning to her for the first time with keen interest. Who tells you that? 
some one who knows? Do you know a man called... Here Mrs. Thornbury laid down her knitting, and a look of extreme solicitude came into her eyes. There is Mr. Hurst, she said quietly. St. John had just come through the swing door. He was rather blown about by the wind, and his cheeks looked terribly pale, unshorn and cavernous. After taking off his coat he was going to pass straight through the hall and up to his room, but he could not ignore the presence of so many people he knew, especially as Mrs. Thornbury rose and went up to him, holding out her hand. But the shock of the warm, lamp-lit room, together with the sight of so many cheerful human beings sitting together at their ease, after the dark walk in the rain and the long days of strain and horror, overcame him completely. He looked at Mrs. Thornbury and could not speak. Everyone was silent. Mr. Pepper's hand stayed upon his night. Mrs. Thornbury somehow moved him to a chair, sat herself beside him, and with tears in her own eyes said gently, You have done everything for your friend. Her actions set them all talking again, as if they had never stopped, and Mr. Pepper finished the move with his knight. There was nothing to be done, said St. John. He spoke very slowly. It seems impossible. He drew his hand across his eyes as if some dream came between him and the others and prevented him from seeing where he was. And that poor fellow, said Mrs. Thornbury, the tears falling again down her cheeks. Impossible, St. John repeated. Did he have the consolation of knowing? Mrs. Thornbury began very tentatively. But St. John made no reply. He lay back in his chair, half seeing the others, half hearing what they said. He was terribly tired, and the light and warmth, the movements of the hands, and the soft communicative voices soothed him. They gave him a strange sense of quiet and relief. As he sat there motionless, this feeling of relief became a feeling of profound happiness. Without any sense of disloyalty to Terence and Rachel, he ceased to think about either of them. The movements and the voices seemed to draw together from different parts of the room, and to combine themselves into a pattern before his eyes. He was content to sit silently watching the pattern build itself up looking at what he hardly saw. The game was really a good one, and Mr. Pepper and Mr. Elliot were becoming more and more set upon the struggle. Mrs. Thornbury, seeing that St. John did not wish to talk, resumed her knitting. Lightning again, Mrs. Flushing suddenly exclaimed. A yellow light flashed across the blue window and for a second they saw the green trees outside. She strode to the door, pushed it open, and stood half out in the open air. But the light was only the reflection of the storm which was over. The rain had ceased, the heavy clouds were blown away, and the air was thin and clear although vaporish mists were being driven swiftly across the moon. The sky was once more a deep and solemn blue, and the shape of the earth was visible at the bottom of the air, enormous, dark, and solid, rising into the tapering mass of the mountains, and pricked here and there on the slopes by the tiny lights of villas. The driving air, the drone of the trees, and the flashing light which now and again spread a broad illumination over the earth, filled Mrs. Flushing with exultation. 
her breasts rose and fell. Splendid, splendid, she muttered to herself. Then she turned back into the hall and exclaimed in a peremptory voice, Come outside and see, Wilfred. It's wonderful. Some half stirred, some rose, some dropped their balls of wool and began to stoop to look for them. To bed, to bed, said Miss Allen. It was the move with your queen that gave it away, Pepper, exclaimed Mr. Elliot triumphantly, sweeping the pieces together and standing up. He had won the game. What? Pepper beaten at last? I congratulate you, said Arthur Venning, who was wheeling old Mrs. Paley to bed. All these voices sounded gratefully in St. John's ears as he lay half asleep, and yet vividly conscious of everything around him. Across his eyes passed a procession of objects, black and indistinct, the figures of people picking up their books, their cards, their balls of wool, their work baskets, and passing him one after another on their way to bed. End of chapter 27 End of the Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf